got a couple more people coming in, so we'll wait one second. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. Thank you for being here. This would be the sixth and uh, final evening in the series. I sure appreciate everybody coming each, each week. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we do praise you and thank you for this series and, and your precious word that is being opened up to us uh, in the study of the feast. Father, we especially uh, praise you for uh, our opportunity to see you. Jesus, our Messiah, within these feasts and what these all are about and weaving a tapestry of your plan for salvation. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we are on to Shavuot, which is, uh, although it's uh, the sixth and final night in the, in the series, this is the fourth uh, of the feasts, and it is in the middle of the spring feasts and the fall feasts. It has a, a extremely significant uh, applications to both Jews and Gentiles, both to the Jewish faith and the Christian faith. And there's a lot of significance just in that fact, and we'll, we'll go along and discuss that. We're also going to talk about what I call the riddle of Haggai. And it's an important topic to study. If you remember a few weeks back <clears throat> when I discussed the Feast of Trumpets, I, I discussed who was that man outside of Jericho, and a complete understanding of who that man was is very helpful in a conversation with an unbelieving Jewish person. And the riddle of Haggai is another one of those. There are a number of them, but uh, that one back at Jericho and this one in the book of Haggai are two of the most significant. I doubt if most people look at the book of Haggai all that often, but there's some real good stuff in there. Hopefully when we're all done tonight, you might go and read, read the book. It's not very long, but it's uh, got a wonderful application to Shavuot. But before we get there, are there any questions regarding last week? We had Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Any, any questions on any of that? Okay. So let's go ahead and start out with what I call the riddle of Haggai. And this is Haggai 2, 6 through 9. And I'll go ahead and read it. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more... It is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. It's not very often that you see uh, the Holy Spirit inspire a prophet to repeat over and over again who is speaking. And we're talking about God himself. And we're talking about a prophet that was sent to the group of people that were rebuilding the temple. This would be what would be known as the second temple. There are four temples in Scripture. We have the first temple, which was known as Solomon's Temple. And that was a very grand, glorious temple with gold and the cedars of Lebanon and all of those wonderful things that Solomon had the wherewithal to put in there. But more importantly, it had the, the Shekinah, or the Shekinah, glory descend upon that temple. And that's the glory of God himself dwelt in that temple. That's a very important point to start our search through this riddle. The second temple is this one here that they're building and they're, they were dragging their feet and that's why Haggai was sent to them to encourage them and within the encouragement of 
uh, getting this temple finally built, they were told that the glory of this temple, the one you're building, is going to be greater than Solomon's temple. And then, after some time goes by, Herod will get a hold of this temple and doll it up. He'll, he'll make it more grand. But the temple that these uh, fellows here were building, were not. it was not going to be nearly as nice as Solomon's temple. They didn't ha have that wherewithal, right? They had returned to the land. So here they're being told it's going to be greater. And then when Herod got a hold of it, Herod was not uh, a, a well-liked person by the Jewish people, but he did doll it up. He made it uh, more glorious, but the glory of Herod and what he did to the temple is not what we're talking about in any way, shape, or form. But here's the problem for Jewish people. What happened to the second temple? It was destroyed in 70 A.D. And there's really not a lot of Jewish people that can tell you what occurred uh, with this second temple that would be greater than what had occurred with Solomon's temple. And in fact, it was a catastrophe to have that second temple destroyed because that ended the animal sacrifices, and they, they've been ended until this very day. So the third temple is yet to be built, and that will be built either right before or during the tribulation period of time. And that third temple will see the abomination of desecration uh, show up, just like it showed up in this second temple, which we talked about uh, when we talked about Hanukkah. Okay? And then the fourth temple is the temple of the end of days that you can read all about in the, in the book of Ezekiel with the measuring reeds and things like that. So we're just going to leave this riddle hanging over here because uh, we'll, get, we'll get the answer to it in the rest of the lesson. But it is a problem or a conundrum for Jewish people, so therefore the answer can help us to share the true Messiah with them. That and, and that man outside of Jericho, along with some others. But for this series, those two will be my focus to hopefully plant in your minds. And if you have the opportunity to share, you can, you can bring them out and, and start by asking questions. And where did we learn that in the Jewish culture, asking theological questions is a good start in conversation and debate? And that would be from Messiah Jesus himself. You'll, you'll see all through the Gospels where he asks a lot of questions. So it's a good method when you're sharing with Jewish people. All right, so back to Leviticus 23. Now, we started a little bit further down in the book, and, and we're winding around. And the reason we did that is we started uh, in the fall holy days because the series started right on the fall holy days, and we thought it'd be kind of cool to match it right up since that was what was going on uh, in the Jewish community. So we've come around, and we went on through and uh, picked up uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits last week. And then well, now we're going to go into that period that began in the middle of the Passover week or the un uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in that particular time, it was on a Sunday morning, and we began what we call the Sifrit HaOmer, which is counting the sheaves, is what that means. If you look at the Jewish calendars, you'll actually see them count day by day. And there's blessings that they do and all that. And then right in the middle, there's a, a fast day to commemorate some things that happen in Jewish history. But it is a counting of seven Sabbath days plus one day. Seven Sabbath days is 49 days plus one is 50. So uh, that's where we get uh, the term Pentecost means 50. Shavuot means weeks or the seven Sabbaths. So at the beginning of, of that Sunday in the middle of the uh, Passion Week, we have the counting of the sheaves and that happens to this day. Most people don't understand it very well, so I hope to um, share with you tonight what it's all about and how that leads us to the holiday of Shavuot. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. 
Count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. Now that's a little bit more complicated there. An ephah is a measurement, but we're talking about two wave loaves. So we're talking about bread that's baked into a loaf, and it shall be baked with leaven. So when you see the, the loaves today that are waved, they are the hollow bread, the, the braided kind of things that you see on the Sabbath day. But he makes sure to say, baked with leaven, we're now away from the unleavened bread. And we're back to the recognition that we're a sinful people. And that's what this is all about. We're back to you folks are sinful. And so with that, he's going to have some offerings that go with the waving. Now, when you see the word first fruits, uh, that doesn't pin you down on the calendar like it seems like it would because that third holiday in the Passover week is called first fruits. <clears throat> but we actually call that early first fruits. And then we have the latter first fruits, which is Shavuot, it's called that. But to confuse us all the more, in the fall or the harvest uh, holidays, we also refer that to the harvest or the fall first fruits. So what this word is, is more than a location on a holiday, but more what our action is. So it's talking about our first fruits. So we bring our first fruits on the first day of the week, if you will, to this very day in our tithes and offerings. That's also a, a first fruit. So... Now we've established we're sinful people. We got past the unleavened bread, back to leavened bread. So he gives us some sacrifices to do, and that is in verse 18. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year, without blemish, one young bull, and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So we have seven Sabbath days, so each, each one of these lambs is going to cover each one of these weeks. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. So we have the sin offering has to go first. You have to have the sin atoned for before we can do a peace offering. And that fits in with... with our relationship with Jesus. We have to have our sin atoned for before we can embrace and, and experience the peace of our salvation. So this is not um, just uh, haphazard the way the Lord has put these. He, there's an order to these things for a reason. So in verse 20, the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So there again, we, we have a special Sabbath day. Now, I mentioned last week, I believe that we, we start counting from the, the regular Sabbath day during the Passover week. Uh, uh, predominantly, the Jewish people follow the counting from after the special Sabbath day of preparation. Uh, I believe it's after the seventh day regular Sabbath because we don't have a, a, a date uh, uh, given to us here. So we're always going to land on, on a um, Sunday here. If, if we counted from the day after the Sabbath of preparation for unleavened bread, we know that that's the 15th of Nisan, so we know we would always count from the 16th. And in Leviticus, it doesn't talk about dates, so I believe that it's to, to happen after the regular Sabbath, which means you're always going to end up on a different date on the lunar calendar, but always it's going to be on a Sunday. It, it's not a major point to argue, but uh, there are two schools of thought, and both sides have very good points of view. So, 
today, in modern times, we, we do count from after the Sabbath of preparation. But my bottom line point here is here's another Sabbath, uh, another special Sabbath. So remember when we talked in the first week, we talked about the Sabbath day. You have your seventh-day Sabbath, but then you have about four or five uh, Sabbaths of convocation. So there are more Sabbaths than just that seventh-day Sabbath on the Jewish calendar. So we definitely have one here. And regardless of how we count uh, and when we start to count, the Passion Week that our Messiah was crucified was started uh, on the day after the seventh-day Sabbath, so Sunday to Sunday, for whatever that's worth. Now, we go on, and in verse 22, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. That's weird. Throughout Leviticus 23, if I put the whole thing back up that we've covered, it's all been about the feasts starting with the Sabbath day and then on through all the feasts, except for the two Hanukkah and Purim that uh, were established by men but ordained by God. And then just in the middle of Leviticus 23, he puts in verse 22, which is very unusual because it's referring primarily to the stranger or the foreigner. And who would that be? Gentiles. That's very unusual, and we better stop and look at that, and I promise we'll do that uh, tonight. But it also should remind you of an, a particular stranger to the land, and that's Ruth. So I, I'm going to stop and discuss her and Boaz and Sifrat Ha-Omer, which is counting the sheaves. The book of Ruth, which happens to be probably my favorite book of the Bible, takes place during the counting of the sheaves, if you weren't aware of that. Let me, let me read just a little portion of, of Ruth. This is in chapter 3, 15 through 18. kind of brings the, the connection home. Also, he said, and that he is Boaz. At this point, what's happened is Ruth has returned to the land of Israel with her mother-in-law, and her sister-in-law decided not to come. And that, that happened in chapter 1. And Ruth does that really wonderful um, scene, if you will, in the book where, where the one daughter-in-law goes, but she comes back and she clings to Naomi, and, and then she says, I'm going with you, basically. And she says, um, your God will be my God. And Naomi does her best to scoot her away. And then... She finally gives in, and away they go. What, what is implied, but not really identified succinctly, is that during the journey, Ruth is schooled by Naomi in the ways of God and in the ways of the Jewish people, how they relate to God. So you will see when Ruth arrives in Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi, she knows a lot of the rules, if you will, including that verse that we just read in um, Leviticus 23, because Ruth and Naomi come back somewhat penniless. And so she is not only a stranger, but she's a poor stranger. So she finds her way to a particular field to glean after that verse, and it happens to be the field of Boaz, who happens to be related to Naomi, and therefore related by marriage to Ruth. So Boaz says, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. So when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Well, that's far from being empty-handed. That is not an amount of barley that is going to be something used in the kitchen for, for oneself. That is enough barley to sell. 
That is not the idea of gleaning, right? So this, of course, speaks volumes to Naomi, and she says, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. And what that matter is, is Boaz tells Ruth when they meet together on the threshing room floor the night of uh, uh, one of the ingatherings of the barley, that um, your kindness towards me is very evident that we are uh, looking at each other as prospective mates, but I cannot uh, redeem you unto me and your family because there is a kinsman closer than me. And then the story goes on that he's going to have to deal with that gentleman. Now, I know a lot of the movies and stories show the other guy is kind of a difficult guy and all that. I don't believe that. I believe that he is quite uh, pleased to take off his shoe, which is the custom to show that he gives up his right to that woman. And I believe that because I think he was already betrothed or married and all that kind of stuff. And so, And I also believe that Boaz was extremely popular, and a, the people were very happy for him. And so the idea, though, of him not resting, we have six measures, right? What do, what do we see with the creation of the world? We have he worked for six days, and then he rested on the seventh. Well, Naomi interprets Boaz's action here as he's not resting until he gets this matter concluded. And so the, the way the matter was concluded, I think, was, makes the book of Ruth extremely romantic. And it also brings her together as uh, the wife of Boaz. And they have uh, a child together. And that child was named Bo uh, Obed, who would be the father of Jesse, who would be the father of David, who would be the father uh, in the lineage of the Messiah. So what's interesting about that? Ruth would be the third Gentile woman in that line. Interesting. So we see the poor stranger in Leviticus 23. It plays out in the book of Ruth and eventually right on down to the birth of Jesus. So that verse in Leviticus 23 becomes very apropos to the church. So let's go on and see how all that happens. So Shavuot. The Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, let's take a look at some of the symbols. We have right here, at the end of the barley harvesting, that, that seven weeks, we now have a new harvest, the early harvest of the wheat. So Shavuot is all about harvesting the next harvest, which is the wheat, or the uh, later first fruit. And then that scroll there is the book of Ruth. So the book of Ruth is attached very much by the Jewish people to Shavuot. Then we have over here, we have Mount Sinai and the law. Well, what's that got to do with Shavuot? Well, the rabbis got together, and while they were studying this, they started doing the math, and guess what they found? That on Shavuot, the law was given to Moses. Remember when the children of Israel came out of the land? We talked all about that last week with Passover, and they got away from Pharaoh and went through the Red Sea and then out into the wilderness. Well, seven weeks and a day later is when Moses came down uh, from the mountain with, with the first set of tablets, or the law, or what we call the Torah. So the, the Torah, remember I talked about rabbinical Judaism in the first week? Everything's towards Judaism and the Torah. So this is extremely important to the Jewish people. And then down below, here's another picture. And this picture represents an awful lot. First of all, you have the scrolls, again, that represents the Torah. And we also have the, the little pointer. It looks like a little hand with the finger pointing. Remember, there's no spaces in between the Hebrew. And they're essentially like we would think capital letters, and so to keep your place, they have this little pointer that they'll follow along, and then of course the, the kippah or the yarmulke there, and that's all regarding study of Torah, and it's a big deal uh, on Shavuot to study the Torah as well as read Ruth. So let's talk about the symbolism of Shavuot. 
The rabbinical symbolism is what I was saying, the giving of the law or Torah and the celebration of God's bounty at the wheat harvest time or latter first fruits. And they also look at that is the bounty he's given them at uh, the, the area. And this takes place right around June, May, June area, right at uh, uh, coming up on summer. And with that harvest, they also look at that as a promise from God for a good harvest in the fall. So a lot of these are centered around the agricultural aspect. Now the Christian symbolism is the giving of the Holy Spirit. If you remember Pentecost, that was the main event, right? And the beginning or birth of the church. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and especially, the, the well, both of them, giving of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church age as well. So what happens today on Shavuot? Well, we have the counting of the Omer, and that's that counting of the 50 days that goes on in the calendar. And again, the Omer, Ha-Omer, Ha is the, Omer are the sheaves, so the counting of the sheaves. And then we have the beginning uh, of the first evening. The family starts out with a fancy dinner. All the great uh, china and all the fancy stuff comes out. And the family has a, a wonderful meal. And with, with that wonderful meal, the primary dessert is cheesecake or cheese blintzes or something, but, but cheesecake seems to be the favorite. Remember in the fall we had the Simchat Torah celebration, celebrating the Torah? Well, we're back again to celebrating the Torah, and we're back again to the dairy dishes. But in this case, uh, we've got cheesecake going. And again, we're, we're talking about every single feast has something to do with food, even the fast of Yom Kippur. We we are eating the theology, if you will. So this again represents the milk of the word. And Paul sort of, I don't want to say he countered the milk of the word, but he used it as an example to encourage the believers, the new believers, especially in Jesus, to go for the meat. Go from the milk to the meat. Because who, who does milk? Babies move up, mature up to the meat of the word. So Paul is using these uh, celebrations of the dairy to encourage people to go further than that. And it's kind of interesting because uh, most Jewish people don't dive that deep in, into the Bible. Uh, the students do, the Orthodox men do, but generally Jewish people on a whole don't. And so Paul was right. So that still applies. They, they don't get into the meat of the word. Then, in the synagogues, the men will all often study all night, the first night. There's two nights in this holiday. And they do that to commemorate the giving of the law, and then, again, they'll have more cheesecake. And they also, during the night, will read the book of Ruth. But also for the, the um, special Sabbath reading, remember we have the Torah reading, that's something out of the, the first five books of Moses, and it goes in order. And then we have the second reading is the Haftarah, and sometimes there's a third reading. And in uh, Shavuot, the, the Haftarah portion is the first chapter of Ezekiel, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then after that, sections of the book of Ruth are read. So the, the Jewish people really focus on the fact that that the book of Ruth is lined up between Passover and Shavuot and goes right in there. And, it, and it, one of the reasons for that is because it historically shows that these feasts and things have been going on all of these centuries. And then lastly, we have the rabbis uh, waving the sheaves. Sometimes they'll wave the sheaves of the wheat. Uh, most often they'll try to emulate what happened way back in, in the Bible days of waving the loaves, and there's two loaves. Whenever you see two, it usually indicates a double portion or a double blessing. And that always reminds me of the audacious request that Elisha made following one of the greatest of prophets, Elijah. And Elisha said, uh, you know, give me double what you gave Elijah. And 
indeed, God did that. The seven great miracles of Elijah were, were eclipsed by 14 great miracles done through Elisha. I don't know if you ever picked up on that, but that's a, that's a good one to take a look at, that he actually received the double blessing. And there's a number of times in Scripture where somebody's told to do something, like the one king, you know, beat the, I think it was the arrows or something on, on the windowsill, and he only hit him like three times. And, and God said, you should have just kept doing that, and I would have given you, I, I think it was one of the, the Assyrians or somebody, um, I would have given the whole victory to you, and instead you're just going to get a portion of that. Well, Elisha got it, and he, he said, give me the double, and he got it. So that's sort of a lesson for us, and we're told in the New Testament, you, you have not because you ask not. So ask in Jesus' name, it's, but it's got to come from the heart. In no way, shape, or form am I talking about name and claim it and stuff. No. Elisha was not asking for stuff. He was asking for the opportunity to glorify God twice as much as his mentor because he really wanted to serve him and glorify him. And that's what we're talking about. You have not because you ask not. Not stuff. Hope I make that clear. All right, let's move on. So, I've talked for a while and <laughs> talked about Shavuot, but let me, let me give you a round up on it in 60 seconds. Shalom and welcome to Jewish Holidays in 60 Seconds. Today's holiday is Shavuot. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, commemorates the anniversary of the day God gave the Torah to the entire nation of Israel assembled on Mount Sinai. You have now completed counting the Omer, 50 days since the Passover. This holiday is also known as Pentecost, which means 50th day. Not only did God give the law, but it is also harvest time for wheat. Shavuot is also the day an individual can bring Bikurim, or the first fruit offerings, to the temple. They include wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. Modern tradition includes reading poetry, consuming dairy products, reading the Book of Ruth, decorating the home with plants, and an all-night Torah study. Good times! Shavuot is a great time to celebrate God's provision and all the ways He has sustained the Jewish people throughout history. How are you celebrating God's provision? And that is Shavuot in 60 seconds. Recapped it pretty well, didn't it? So, let's answer that riddle of Haggai. Do you remember when we were discussing Sukkot and we found that uh, Jesus was born at Sukkot and he came and he tabernac tabernacled uh, with us and then a little after that he was presented in the temple. Do you remember that? And uh, uh, Shimon or Simeon was there and scooped him out of the arms of the priest who was going to walk around and say, uh, this child has been redeemed because the shekels were paid and, and the, in this case the pigeons were offered for sacrifice. But Simeon stepped in and, and took hold of the baby because he was promised by God that he would see Messiah before he tasted death. And so uh, Holy Spirit showed him, here is the Messiah you've been waiting for. So he walked around the court saying, I have seen my redemption. Remember that part? So, the first part of the riddle is that this temple would see the presentation of Messiah Jesus, God the Son. So, after that, we have Shavuot arrive. And we have a misnomer, and I discussed this earlier in the series, that a lot of people think that the disciples or the followers, primarily the apostles, hid out in the upper room. Well, that was true for a short period of time only. Remember we had the uh, appearance of Jesus into that locked room, not once but twice. We had the first appearance, and uh, uh, Thomas was not there, and then he came back. Uh, eight days later and, and basically entered through the walls or doors and presented himself again. But after that, Luke 24.52 tells us that they were so encouraged by their interactions with, with Jesus 
that they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. This is back down from the Sea of Galilee. And were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. They're not hiding out anymore. So what we see at Pentecost, that first Pentecost for the church, did not occur in the upper room like some people think. It occurred at the temple. The word house there is talking about the temple. And this is very significant that we understand this. So Luke tells us that they were continually in the temple. So you can bet that on Shavuot, that's where they were because that's where they belonged. And we have the Haftarah portion I mentioned was Ezekiel chapter 1. The Haftarah of Ezekiel chapter 1 is called the Merkava. Merkava means chariot. And I get a big kick out of the fact that the Israeli main battle tank in their modern army of today is called the Merkava. And it's considered one of the best tanks, if not the best tank, in the world today. And if you ever hear people say, well, I don't think the United States should give all this stuff and money to Israel. Uh, they, you know, they're just taking. Well, Israel's one of the only countries that pays us back for anything. And two, they also give us an incredible amount of intel. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but President Bill Clinton changed the rules on espionage, and we're not allowed to use the uh, unsavory folks that that can be paid off in the Middle East for information and stuff like that anymore. So we have to rely an awful lot on technology and on Israel. Israel pays us way, way back in intelligence through their agencies, Mossad and others. And speaking of the Merkava tank, there's technology on the tank that will explode uh, incoming shells before they actually hit the tank. And that technology is on our tanks. And that was developed with Israel's help, probably predominantly Israel's help. And so Israel does pay us back uh, quite nicely. But the Merkava tank is, is one of the best, if not the best, in the world. So Merkava, chariot. And the Ezekiel 1, it's been stated by the rabbis over the centuries that it really should not be read as a haftarah. But it still is, and it was back then. And I just want to read you a portion of, of the Merkava Haftarah portion out of Ezekiel 1. And you probably uh, are not that familiar with the book of Ezekiel. Most people know sections of it, and chapter 1 is one of those sections. So this might sound familiar to you. But Ezekiel writes, And I looked, and I behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And if you read that, you, you are reading about the wheels. Well, what that means in Hebrew is, is what it, like this enfolding. It's this constant turning in. And I don't know if you've ever sat and stared in a fireplace and every once in a while you'll see the flames will spin. It's kind of fun to watch that. That's kind of what it's describing here is these flames doing some radical motion like wind has got a hold of it. So, about the time that they're in the temple for the, the Shavuot service and the, the the book of Acts says, and when Pentecost was fully come, does that sound familiar? Uh, they were in, in this one place of the house. And what that's saying is, fully come, that means the next morning. Remember we talked the first week about the day starts in the evening? Well, you have the different Shavuot services and practices in the evening, and then, then people stay up all night. I'm not sure if they stayed up all night back in those days, but it's possible. And one of the reasons it's possible is they went to early service, if you will. And remember we talked about being a detective in Scripture. How do I know they were there early? Because a little bit later we're going to have this scenario where people accuse some of them of being drunk, and Peter says, it's not yet. Uh, the third hour, which on the clock is 9 a.m. So 
they're in the temple probably somewhere around 8 a.m. Oh, early service, right? And of course, you would have a number of services throughout the morning because you've got thousands of people coming up there. Because remember I told you that there are three sections of the calendar that the men must go to Jerusalem, if at all possible. You have the spring feast, that group of three, and then you have Shavuot, and then you have the fall feast, the uh, 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 trumpets, and then Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, or tabernacles. So this is the middle one. So people are going to try to get there to the temple. So somebody is reading the Merkava. They're reading this stuff I just read to you. And then look what happens right in the middle of that reading. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So God chose this point on a holiday, Shavuot, um, and apparently... Uh, during the reading of the enfolding fire to actually bring it to life. And what is this? This is the Holy Spirit descending on the apostles. Pretty exciting stuff. And then they go out and they, they start teaching and preaching in other languages. Because you had all these people in town from all over the place. They spoke different dialects. So, the answer to the riddle... That word greater is gadol. And the word gadol means to magnify, and it also means more in the sense of quantity. So with the Shekinah glory in the first temple, how is this greater? Well, we have the presentation of God the Son. So if you will, the first temple, the Shekinah glory, is God the Father. Now we have God the Son, and then, 33 and a half years later, we have the presentation in the same temple of God the Holy Spirit. So you see, we have a triune God. And so the greater, we're talking about one here in the first temple, and then two aspects of the Trinity in the second. So there's the answer to your riddle. But the reason it's important is Jewish people can't tell you why it would have been greater because there was nothing greater about it in their viewpoint or their history and then it was destroyed so there's no um, going forward with that temple and by the way within the temple there were records kept in genealogies and so when they're looking for Messiah the records of going back to David are gone now we know that Jesus went back to David by the way the the two uh, genealogies are found in the two different Gospels. One is uh, back to Joseph, um, the supposed father, and the other is back through Mary. So if you weren't aware of that, Mary's line and Joseph's line go to Jesus. And it's a whole other lesson, but basically through Joseph is the right to the throne, and through Mary is the bloodline. And so God wraps that all nice and neat. And the reason for that, and again, another lesson, is because there was a curse on one of the kings called Jeconiah. And if you want to read that um, in, in the history of the kings, uh, you can find that. So that's why there were two genealogies. So there's the answer to your riddle. Put that in your, um, your satchel, uh, if you will, for if you have an opportunity to, to discuss these things with a Jewish person. And you can also... Uh, bring out the meeting of the man by Joshua. And I'll remind you, they'll, they'll say, well, that was an angel. Angels never would ask Joshua, the, now the protector of the Torah, to get down in obeisance or worship. Never. And that's clearly what he did, just like Moses did. That man is the same as the burning bush. You can't get around that argument. Okay, so... So they're outside now of the courts of the temple. They've just received the Holy Spirit. And they're now talking to people. So I'm going to back up now. We talked about the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, back with Moses. So let's review what happened there. 
And he said to them, this is Exodus 32, 27 and 28, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. He's talking to the Levites. And it says here, So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. And what that was all about was when Moses came down from the mountain, what did he find? The golden calf, right? And virtually a bunch of orgy stuff going on. They, they didn't take long to turn, turn their eyes away from the Lord who had set them free and, and did the plagues, part of the Red Sea. And so Moses turned them loose at the command of God and the Levites slew 3,000 men. Now let's fast forward to this Shavuot uh, just after Jesus rose. What, now we have the descending of the Holy Spirit on these people and, and they're going out and they're preaching and teaching. And the main preacher that day was Peter. Peter's a great character. He, he's the comeback kid of all time, right? In, in his failures as a human being and then here we find a totally different guy totally empowered not only uh, by the Holy Spirit but before that by the words of Jesus because if Peter didn't go into the temple every day I don't think the rest of them would have gone either I believe Peter's the, right now the leader and so Peter said to them repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. Isn't that interesting? We had at the giving of the law, 3,000 fell. And at the giving of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 were saved. This is an amazing picture, certainly not coincidental, that the law kills, basically, because nobody can keep the law. The law is, is a pathway of trying to do it yourself. Here, with the grace of God manifested through the Holy Spirit, we rely on what Jesus did for us. And that is where we're saved. Amazing picture. 3,000 fall, 3,000. Okay. So let's tie all of this together, all the six weeks. So starting with a reminder of the Jewish calendar, we have... Nisan, which is around March or April, and that begins the religious prophetic year, and it starts with, with the holidays of Passover. And I misspoke uh, by accident last week and called it the c civil year that uh, I wanted to correct. It is the beginning of the religious year, and also the prophetic picture of these holy days. And so in, in Tishri, September, October area, we, we begin the civil year. And that's why your, your civil calendars, like I brought the Jewish calendar, each week we have um, the beginning of the civil year there in the fall. All right, let's go over the feast. We started with Shabbat or Sabbath, and that symbolizes creation, the creator, and rest. Pesach is the Passover, which is the death of our Messiah. Hag HaMatzah is unleavened bread, which represents the burial of Messiah. Yam HaBikurim, first fruits, the resurrection of Messiah. And remember that Kurim is, uh, you can bring that uh, on Passover time, bring that on Shavuot, you can bring it at the end of the year. In fact, you should. You can also bring that throughout the year. And Christians do that through, through our ties. And if you didn't realize that, you're bringing your first fruits. Most of us will actually set aside, if not physically in our minds, what's going out of our paycheck each time we get a paycheck that we're going to tithe. That's a, a form of following the practice of first fruits. 
And I believe that pleases God. It's not a requirement for salvation or anything like that. And it's to be done out of your own heart cheerfully. But it's a first fruits um, action. Then we have Sifra to Ha Omer. That's counting the sheaves or the waiting. We're, we're waiting for the ascension. Uh, that was that period of time when Jesus reappeared. Shavuot, or Pentecost, also called weeks, is the giving of Ruach HaKodesh. That's the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Then there's nothing. We have the summertime, all the way to the fall feast. And so the summertime represents the time of the Gentiles, or the church age. Rosh Hashanah, we call trumpets, or the Aliyah, or rapture of believers. Now remember, I'm not saying it's going to happen on Rosh Hashanah, but that Rosh Hashanah... Uh, symbolizes that. It could happen, but we're not, we're not going there at all. We're not to do that. Then Yom Kippur is atonement, and that's the Bema judgment. And the Bema judgment is the judgment of believers. So after the rapture, we, we go before the Lord, and we are judged on our merits for what he's going to do or place us in his service during the Millennial Kingdom. We're not judged on our salvation. That's handled at the cross. Then we have Sukkot, tabernacles or booths, and that represents the marriage supper of the Lamb and the dwelling in heavenly mansions. And then the last two are the ones uh, instituted by man but ordained by God. We have Hanukkah, which is Feast of Dedication, or the Festival of Lights, or the Festival of Oil. And that's the tribulation and the entrance into the Millennial Kingdom. So that's uh, going to be reflective of what the Antichrist does in that third temple that will be built probably soon. And then lastly, we have Purim, or Lots, and that's the fast and the feast of Esther. And that's the last attack of Satan and the deliverance of millennial saints and final judgment of the wicked. So I'll come back to that prophetic picture there, and I want to point out the more important aspect of what the feasts outline for us. And this is why I'm up here doing this lesson. God's plan of salvation is revealed in the feasts, starting with the spring feast. That's Passover with unleavened bread, first fruits, all in eight days. And that's all about what Jesus did for us. And we focus in the Christian church on Easter. And it's extremely important to focus on Easter because that it's all about the resurrection. But what I try to teach is that we've got to expand that and include the death of Jesus, his burial, and the resurrection. All Just like the feasts are all wrapped together in the eight days, we should do that in our minds and hearts. And it's okay to do that on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, but it's important to understand all three aspects. So that's what he did for us. Then we come to Shavuot or Pentecost, and I call it the bridge and the power. What's a bridge to? Well, it's a bridge to the Lord himself through the Holy Spirit, through our prayers. We don't know how to pray and what to pray. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit takes our prayers through utterances to God, through Jesus, our mediator. But it's also a bridge between the Jewish faith that has become the Christian faith and the Gentiles are brought in. So it's not just for Jews anymore. He first came to the Jewish people, but that didn't go the way it was planned out, seemingly. And so it is open to the world. But we see that in all the prophecies. Starting right there in, in Leviticus 23, mentioning the poor strangers. And then we see it in the book of Ruth. Ruth, or Naomi, represents the Jewish people and the Torah and all that. And, uh, and that, Naomi represents that, and Ruth represents the Gentiles learning it and finding God through the Jewish Bible, essentially, is what that's all about. And so Shavuot is an example of how God gave himself to all the people. And remember the redemption ceremony when Jesus was walked around? Simeon's talking about a light to the Gentiles. And we see it in Haggai as well. It's all over the place. God knew this was going to go to the whole world. He just did it through the Jews. 
And, of course, we call the, the Holy Spirit there the comforter given to us. So we now go to the fall feast, and that's sort of a future thing. And it's what we do in response to what happened at the cross, symbolized in the spring feast, and then the giving of the Holy Spirit, and what we do in response. And that is a recognition of our sinful nature. We have to understand we're sinful. And then we learn that through the forgiveness of those sins, only through the blood shed by Jesus, and then Jesus dwelling within us, that's Shavuot, and then finally, our eventual dwelling with him, which is symbolized in the fall feast. So do you see, over the six weeks, how that plan of salvation comes right out of these, these feasts? I don't know if that's something you ever saw before, but it's very important. And it's also another opportunity if we have the, uh, a long enough conversation with our Jewish neighbors that we can show them that, hopefully. So this was the handout I gave you. And essentially this is just the, the prophetic events linked in, in chronological order to, to the, uh, the feasts. And we start with uh, Passover, which is the crucifixion. Unleavened bread is burial. First fruits is resurrection. Then we have the counting of the Omer. We come to Shavuot, which is the giving of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church age, which becomes that summertime. Rosh Hashanah uh, is the trumpets, symbolizing the rapture. Then we have Yom Kippur, which symbolizes the great tribulation. We will be, in our belief here at this, this church, we believe we will be raptured before the tribulation. We call that the pre-tribulation rapture. Doesn't mean we won't see persecution, but we won't see the great tribulation. We won't see God's wrath. So we'll be up, up in heaven with Jesus in what we call the wedding supper of the Lamb, and that's symbolized by Sukkot, tabernacles, dwelling. Then we go on to those last two holidays. We have the abomination of desolation, uh, is like Hanukkah. And then we have the thousand years, and at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released from the pit, and he, he comes out and he gets people whipped up, and they're going to actually attack Jesus, believe it or not, and us. And then Jesus deals with them once and for all, and that's the final deliverance, just like the deliverance through the story of Esther. And there you go. We have the prophetic plan of God through, throughout history laid right out there in the feast as well as the plan of salvation. So I want to leave you with this. This might be something you've never caught before, although you, you know it, but we'll put it together. I call it the greatest teaching in history. What would that be? There's three very different but wonderful ways that Jesus taught his followers of the past, the present and the future aspects of these feasts. This greatest teaching of all times actually surrounded the feasts. And these teachings would be foundational to both Jewish and Gentile believers going forward from it. And those teachings would be preserved by his followers to this day and open to us by the Holy Spirit that was given to us on Shavuot. And they were preserved in the writings of the Gospels. They were preserved in the Epistles, epistles meaning letters, mostly written by Paul. So let's look at the three so I can identify them for you. The first one we talked about already uh, was Luke 24, 27, where Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he started appearing to people, and he began to speak uh, such as this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what he did is... He went backward. So he, he gave a past history referring to him and what he did that week. And this is on the road to Emmaus and then other appearances. So that's the first of the three great teachings. Now, if it's the first, then we can automatically see that these are somewhat supernatural. This is after he resurrected and he's showing up here and there. So, so it's a supernatural teaching. They understand it's a supernatural teaching. And in fact, these two guys said, didn't we, our hearts burn within us? So let's go, go forward. 
This is the, what I call the Apostles and the Awesome 40 Days. And this is found in Acts 1, 1 through 3. This is Luke writing his second account um, to Theophilus. The first account is what we call the Gospel of Luke. So this would be the book of Acts. They're a set, right? We all know that. So the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Do you see the picture here? You've got 40 days after he, he showed up, starting with those two appearances, and then after that in Galilee, he was with them, I believe, every single day. They get it. They know now what he's about, and they are listening and understanding. So we have this amazing teaching in which he gives some commandments. And then he, he refers to these apostles to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Do you think that had to be amazing? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there through those 40 days? They had a lot of questions at, uh, on, on the Mount of Olives, and I think he answered a lot of them because we get m more of it written in these epistles, right? So what's the third amazing supernatural teaching? This is a special teaching to Paul. I call it Paul receives special spiritual teaching, and we find this referred to in Galatians 1, 14 through 17. This is very interesting. Paul's speaking. He says, And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, what he's saying there is, God knew what he was going to do with Paul the moment he brought him out from the womb. But he allowed him to grow in, in great knowledge of the Jewish culture and the feasts. And it's Paul who will refer to Jesus as the first fruits and all these kind of things. And he, it's Paul who talks about a little leaven. All these things that have to do what we've been talking about for six weeks. And so what did he do? What did Jesus do with Paul? He, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, meaning he didn't hook up with the, uh, the original apostles. He got this straight from Jesus, and this occurred what they call the backside of Arabia, apparently. He's taken away for three years. Okay, we've got short-term teaching on the road to Emmaus and in, the, uh, in that upper room and all that. Then we have 40 days of rock-solid teaching, but now we've got three years of supernatural teaching. So Paul says, he didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And that was three years of teaching that we get. So when we read what Paul wrote, and he, read, and he talks about the end times, and he talks about the plan of salvation that we see through the feast, all this stuff, this was directly from Jesus. But this is Jesus after he ascended. So here are these three great teachings, and those would be the foundation for the entire New Testament. Because all those people were on the receiving end of this teaching. And, of course, the book of Revelation was John. And again, he gets another dose. I was in the Spirit on that, that day of the Lord. So that's where our New Testament came from. So we go all the way around that calendar and it opens that whole New Testament. That's how important the study of the feasts are. And so we back to my first question on the first night um, and that was what, what's the purpose of this study? And that was to gain a deeper understanding of Scripture and to add insight via a deeper understanding of the cultural symbolism of the feast. And I hope we accomplish that. It was also to understand Matthew 5:17 where Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And we see him in every feast, including the, the two added. 
And so my, my primary purpose then was to proclaim the deity of Jesus, God the Son, his plan, and the surety of his word, and how that applies to us uh, regarding understanding the plan of salvation, regarding what's going to happen prophetically in the end times and all that, and just what goes on each day in our life and how we can rely on him. He's there still. And hopefully to fulfill your expectations for the class. And here's an opportunity to ask yourself uh, if that occurred. So, Anyway, I appreciate so much you coming out each and every week like this, and I hope that you enjoyed this. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we do thank you primarily just for, for your sacrifice on the cross that would begin all the steps of your plan that we find in the feast and recognizing that these steps are our steps to dwelling with you forever and that you did it all, it's all there before us and it just shows us what has occurred in our acceptance of you, our belief in you and our embracing you as our, our savior and where this is going to lead for our eternal destination. We praise you for that and we pray that you would go with us now and give us opportunities to share this information, especially with Jewish people and also with our children and with just anybody that comes our way that we can show them what you've done for us and that you are in true truth the, the only way. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>